In the 1700s, if you wanted to get a message somewhere quickly, you better have a fast horse or hang a lantern in a church tower. But in the centuries that followed, Massachusetts had even more ideas about how to make communications faster, more reliable, and more global. This started with Alexander Graham Bell. He was an instructor at Boston University in the 1870s, and he also had a side hustle as an inventor, renting lab space in downtown Boston. At the time, lots of inventors were thinking about telegraph wires that had been strung up to carry messages in Morse code, and how they might be able to carry multiple messages simultaneously. That was the problem that Bell was working on when he invented the telephone, with a big hand from Lewis Latimer, a black man born in Chelsea, Massachusetts. Later, when he needed to prove that his phone could work over long distances, Graham Bell set up a phone in Boston and had his assistant Watson set up a phone here in this building in Cambridge, two miles away. The following year in 1877, the Bell Telephone Company was founded. Within a decade, 150,000 people around the US had a phone in their home. Not far from here were the first offices of Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. The tech firm spun out of MIT that designed and built the first few routers for the ARPANET, the internet's predecessor in the late 1960s. An employee of BBN also sent the first email over the ARPANET in 1971. He doesn't remember what it said, but he chose the at symbol to separate the user's name from the host computer that they had on their account, a convention that we still use today. By 1973, email represented 75% of all traffic on the ARPANET. Most of the early computers connected to the ARPANET were made by Digital Equipment Corporation, one of the companies that helped to introduce computing to big businesses and government agencies. And it was on a digital mini computer at MIT that a group of students created Space War, the first video game. And the earliest demos of virtual reality and augmented reality headsets at Harvard also relied on computers made by Digital Equipment Corporation. Two of the most well-known pioneering women in computing, Admiral Grace Hopper and Margaret Hamilton, also worked in Cambridge. Hopper developed the first reusable code blocks to help make programming a lot more efficient and also found an actual bug, a moth, in the Harvard Mark I computer, which is why we now refer to errors in code as bugs. Because if there are two things that are dead sure, I don't even have to call them predictions. One is that the amount of data and the amount of information will continue to increase, and it's more than linear. And the other is the demand for instant access to that information will increase, and those two are in conflict. One of the engineers who worked on the Apollo program was Margaret Hamilton. Known for her pioneering work on the software development team, she worked hard to bring the guidance and navigation controls of the Apollo command module and lunar module to help us put astronauts on the moon. Margaret Hamilton is known best for coining the term of software engineering, which up until that point hadn't existed. While Hamilton would leave to start her own company and continue pioneering the field of software development, this was just the beginning of the innovation that Draper had in store. Draper continued its work with NASA for years, culminating in the digital fly-by-wire system, which changed the manual control system of an airplane to electronics. We also continued our work on all of the space shuttle programs, helping on the guidance and navigation for all 135 missions. And in the early days of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web, moved to MIT to ensure that his invention would remain open standard and usable between all computers, as opposed to being controlled by some big tech company. He envisioned something universally accessible and open, where anyone could contribute and share information and learn. His decision to not patent and profit from his invention created the foundation for the rapid and open flow of information that over 5.5 billion people worldwide use today. As demand for more immersive visual experiences on the internet increased and servers struggled to process all of that information, Akamai Technologies was founded in Cambridge in 1998. They launched the first content delivery network to help make the delivery of digital content faster and more reliable. Their approach to distribute content across a network of edge servers closer to the end user reduced the burden on the central servers and helped address what was known at the time as the world wide wait, thus massively improving people's experiences online. Akamai got started as a research project at MIT in 1995. 
we were working on the theoretical or mathematical aspects of algorithms. Down the hall from me was uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who's you know, considered to be the father of the World Wide Web. Tim realized that web congestion was going to be a problem. If you have a website sort of located in one place, that becomes a bottleneck because as a lot of people try to go to that place to get the content, you create what then was called a hotspot or a flash crowd, and it overwhelms the infrastructure there. We realized that was a perfect problem for us to think about is, well, how would we do it differently? And we made a lot of great progress. At the very beginning of the smartphone era, a Massachusetts-based company called Nuance helped Apple to launch its very first AI-powered assistant called Siri. And this helped to springboard the general public's relationship with AI-powered models in our day-to-day -day lives. On the other side of the market, Rich Miner was working in Cambridge to help found one of Apple's greatest competitors. Android. The startup that Google acquired in 2005 to serve as the foundation of its smartphone operating system. Now, that operating system is the most popular in the world, with a 72% market share and more than 3 billion Android devices. That's him calling right now. So I gotta know, what kind of phone are you calling me on? I have multiple phones, so I always have to think, but this one is a Samsung Galaxy S20 Five Alpha? Is it true that you invented Siri a decade before Siri? In the early 90s, we had a company called Wildfire that built the first voice-based personal assistant, and it worked primarily on the phone network, but she had a personality, she told jokes, uh, she'd help schedule calls for you, route calls, and, uh, and in fact, we had a patent for the wake-up word. So when you say, hey Alexa, or hey Google, we had a patent for that back in 1994. How did Google's purchase of Android lead to it to build a campus in Kendall Square? As a co-founder, I just wasn't going to leave Cambridge uh, anyways. I was going to, you know, sit, sit here, living here, and didn't want to move to the West Coast. So it just made sense for us to, you know, start planning to build the company with our, you know, two geographies, West Coast and East Coast. So it was pretty easy for me to convince Google that we should have a, a Boston campus, and that's grown to facilities that can house around 3,000 or more people. How do you envision the future of tech? What other problems do you think that we have that still need solving? We're certainly entering a new era of tech with the evolution of generative AI and AI kind of hitting some new pinnacle of capability. And I think um, you're gonna continue to see as, you know, the, as the kind of New England, Boston, Cambridge, Kendall Square area have always been instrumental in the evolution of new platforms and new technologies into vibrant startups and, and uh, hard problems solved. I think you're going to continue to see that in this next age of AI. What keeps you motivated? I just like to work with smart people solving hard problems. Today, the internet connects more than people. The Internet of Things is revolutionizing work and life as we know it. And Massachusetts companies like Boston Dynamics are fostering the future in robotics and automation. Next time, we'll discover how Massachusetts led the charge for more than one human rights revolution. Subscribe to the Innovation Trails YouTube channel to catch all the videos in this series. Thank you.